We're joined right now on RollerCulture.com by the Honorable Minister of Agriculture for Alberta, Mr. Evan Berger. Welcome today, uh, Evan. Thanks, Sean. Uh, good morning to everyone. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, the government's stance on uh, land rights in Alberta, uh, specifically, I guess, Bill 36, which has been, a, you know, obviously a, lots of discussion in that in a lot of coffee shops, as well as uh, in Edmonton, in the legislature. Uh, as you know, we've interviewed Keith Wilson several times. Um, he has his position on Bill 36, and we want to make sure we gave uh, the government and yourself the opportunity to talk about Bill 36 from, from your point of view. What is the intention of Bill 36? Bill 36, of course, uh, was was amended with Bill 10 last year, uh, 2010. Bill 10 amended the questions that had been brought forward on Bill 36, where pieces had been could be misinterpreted. That was cleared up at that time through Bill 10. So the intent and the whole purpose of Bill 10, Bill 36, as the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, is for future planning of the seven regions of the province based on watersheds. And it's simply fact of life that we have uh, a lot, great many blessings here in Alberta. We're blessed with uh, great agriculture opportunities. We're blessed with gas and oil and subsurface resources. And we're blessed with great recreational opportunities. The curses, they all take place on the same landscape. And there has to be a balanced approach to be able to keep all these things taking place at the same time. So when you when you talk about p- planning, what, from an agricultural perspective, what, what does this planning, what does it entail and what does it mean? Well, from an agriculture perspective, I would look at it right now as uh, protection for agriculture because as we move forward, it's an interesting point that in the last 40 years, arable land per person, arable land per capita in Canada has gone down by 50%. Now, the population has grown, so that gives you a per capita raise, but the arable land has gone down by 50%. Canada rates third in the world for arable land per capita. First is Australia with no water. Second is Kazakhstan with no transportation or infrastructure. Third comes Canada, and Alberta is very well positioned in Canada to be, I think, we're the largest arable land per capita in Canada right now. But in looking at that, as more land goes under cement and under different uses, in the future here, we're going to have six countries in the world that produce more food than they can consume. Canada is one of those six producing nations. Opportunity for agriculture is phenomenal right now, but we have to protect the right to farm, and we have to have the ability to protect land to keep it in production. So... Some of the critics of Bill 36 would say, okay, that, that you know that's fine, we hear you, that, that makes sense, but um, planning really means making changes, and uh, specifically as it applies to uh, ranchers' ability to ranch, or a, a dairyman or a pork or a, or a cattle producer's ability to have a feed yard or a you know, confined uh, feeding operation, where, you know, in the worst case scenario, uh, the government would say, hey, you know, NRCB may have given you this permit, but, you know, sorry, according to our plan, you can no longer have a feed yard here. Well, actually, uh, Sean, there there was amendments in Bill 10 that allowed for variances that would look after something if there was that. Now, if you take that to the to the next level, though, and you were to say, okay, Bill 36 has nothing in it that develops the plan. That comes out of the regional advisory council and then the consultations with the public which goes back and forth three times after the regional advisory council puts forward a set of recommendations now the set of recommendations that came out of the south saskatchewan i think if people are are online and looking at that and commenting on it they will be very very uh impressed with it because it does a great job for protecting agriculture protecting lease land protecting the operations that we have in in our southern Alberta and our makeup of southern Alberta. And it's out there for consultation right now, right until the 30th of April. When people put their points in, it comes back in and is redrawn again. So the plan that comes forward is actually the plan of the people of the area. The act is simply the legislation that upholds the plan. So there, there is, uh, for, just so I make clear, so you, the, whether it's the committee that uh, contr- or that uh, administers this plan, um, there's farmers and ranchers involved. There's also farmer, farmers and ranchers that have every opportunity to contribute ideas on what that plan should look like. Exactly. And uh, 
one of the things that came out of the the regional advisory council advice that's contrary to all the comments that have been out there is they said that in many of these areas of uh, I think they identified seven different areas that said these are fantastic areas for water recharge for carbon sinks and they're currently in native grasslands and being leased and have been treated the right way everything's good we should extend the leases they look for longer tenure on these leases so that's the opposite of what anyone has ever said that leases a statutory consent and they're recommending those leases go into longer term so what, what about some of the criticism though that okay that making the plan is fine but uh, based on some of the writing or the wording in, in Bill 36, uh, there is issues regarding the overriding power the government or the cabinet could have in terms of making changes or taking away things or giving people... Th- what do you say to that? Well, actually, that's an interesting point because the lawyer that makes that comment also used to uh, consult extensively on AOPA and that type of thing, and, and he was the one who brought forward the ability for NRCB to overrule local municipalities in his own in his own uh, in his own paper on the impact of AOPA on dairy farm expansion. He goes on to say that you know the the government through the NRCB was cognizant that municipalities may have people that are are not willing to have uh, certain activities take place in areas and may have exclusion zones, but in there government was cognizant of that and allowed for NRCB to overrule the local municipality, but then he goes on to say that, you know, you should contact legal counsel, basically, and we can step all over the, the municipal zoning. Well, that's a plan of the people at the local level that have been taken away. What a plan does under Bill 36 is if the plan identified, uh, you know, this area is uh, pristine, it's perfect, and they're looking at that as, all right, we have the ability here to keep this specific area in that use. It's in native grass right now. It's in pasture. It's lease land. That plan, when it says, okay, now that's what it is going to be there, the act enforces that, yes, that shall be there. The overriding piece that he's talking about, though, if you look at it from a perspective of, of let's take it. Let's take an example of competing statutory consents. You've got a statutory consent on water, and I'll use the Stavely Aquifer as a, as a reference. Stavely Aquifer puts out 300 gallons a minute, 15 feet in the air out of a 3-inch pipe without a pump. Now, there's many statutory consents on that aquifer, whether they feed farm, feed lots downstream. That aquifer is a huge water source in southern Alberta there could be a statutory consent below that aquifer that would be a carbon statutory consent, an opportunity for company X to drill for that carbon. So we've got two statutory consents stacked. Now let's just say that the carbon extraction company came in and said they want to drill directly down through that, and there was this opportunity before. The ERCB may not be cognizant of that actual aquifer being there. In the plan, if the plan comes forward and says there shall be no drilling through known aquifers for carbon extraction, that plan then overrides the ERCB or the NRCB or any other government body from allowing that to be drilled through, directly through that. Now, I'll cite the case in 2005 or 2006 when this actually happened near Stavely. There's seven water trucks, back trucks, sucking water up after they drilled through it and lost it to the top side. There was cats pushing up dirt to keep the water contained, and there was cement trucks pumping cement in to plug the top off. It was finally plugged off. But in Section 11 that that lawyer speaks of, there's the ability to amend, negotiate, or rescind a statutory consent. So let's take that statutory consent and say there's six feedlots downstream on that water supply. There's oil underneath it. Now, when they go to drill for that oil ERCB would say the plan, as the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan says, you cannot drill directly through that aquifer. Company X says, well, we can because we have a statutory consent below that and we're going to. The ERCB has the ability to negotiate and say, no, uh, we need to amend this, move over here 200 yards and go down and go under, but do not go directly through it. If the company didn't want to amend, then we'd say, okay, there's a bit to negotiate. Here's a monetary settlement, move over there, drill down, 
and don't risk that water supply to all those other statutory consent holders. If Company X still refused, the ability is there to say, okay, we'll have to rescind that deep statutory consent because we can't come to an agreement on that and we will not sacrifice water for that carbon resource. And a lot of that needs to be put into perspective because you're, you're putting a precedence on whose statutory consent is the top one, that type of thing. Water will always be taught. In southern Alberta, you know, there's, there's uh, one of the other things that came out of the Regional Advisory Council advice is we need to store more off-stream water. We're sending more than we need to across the border. The ability to increase irrigation and production in southern Alberta depends on more water storage and wisely using more use of water. So a lot of their, of their recommendations are very pro-agriculture. They're very pro to keeping and prospering in southern Alberta and moving our industry forward. So what is the feed, you know, to, what is the feedback been to your office from farmers and ranchers regarding uh, Bill 36? What are, what are people saying to you? Actually, you know, there's, there's many of them that are, are playing... Uh, the fact that, okay, they, many wanted the ability for environmental goods and services to have have a payment schedule set up. Well, there is that ability in the Alberta Land Stewardship Act. You know, these, these bills, bill is what comes into the legislature. The act is the finished product. So you've amended act, the Alberta Land Stewardship Act that had the Bill 10 amendments. So you have to go with the act. That act as it is, many are looking at it and saying, wow, this is enabling legislation. There's an opportunity there to get compensation for environmental goods and services that farmers and ranchers have been providing for, for nothing for years. There's enabling legislation. They look at it. There's opportunity. There's uh, those who also ask for that. Some are saying, well, now, because they've had this legal counsel running around, are saying, well, gee, maybe we've got some risk here. But... In the overall picture, I think when they step back and take the politics out of the situation and just look at planning, every municipality has a municipal development plan. They have to. They do it all the time. You have that across the across the world. There's planning in place. You know, it's it's pretty needed to have uh, all of our different things move forward. We have to have a plan in place. Well, uh, Mr. Berger, I really, really appreciate your time today uh, explaining, uh, kind of giving the government in your perspective, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you again sometime soon on some other issues. Well, I think it's it's great to, to talk about it, John, because uh, in, in that same thing, that same lawyer does put out that you have to be proactive because uh, if, if you don't, the other side of the story becomes correct, whether it is or not, and that, that's in his AOPA comments and and that's it too the more they tell the same story it doesn't make it true but it becomes accepted so we have to definitely get the facts out there we have to look at this as a uh, ability for albertans to continue to prosper and the different things that are dependent upon planning in southern alberta you know i always say it when they the comment come around about the land area project assembly act Southern Alberta benefits from 50 man-made water bodies. We have two natural water bodies, being Pekaki Lake and Waterton Lakes. Neither of those irrigate. All of those water bodies were either built on private or public land. There had to be the ability for that to take place. There had to be acts and legislation in place to deal with landowners to be able to make fair settlement. That's what we're looking at in all of these things is the ability to continue to move forward. And I challenge anyone to find me in an irrigation canal that follows directly on a road allowance or utilizes a road allowance. They don't. They follow topography. They follow elevations. All those pieces of the puzzle that we all know is just commonplace. There there had to be abilities for those investments to take place to make those realities come true. You know, to run run around uh, like a chamois salesman and stir up public mistrust of these things doesn't further the conversation to the end goal for Albertans' better cause. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thanks, Sean.